Thank you, Jesus. Hey, man, let's all stand together here this morning. There's a great atmosphere already in this place. Just a liberty and a freedom. Can we take a moment right now, everybody across the building, lift your hands. Hallelujah. That's it. Come on, in one mind, in one accord. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, I already know you love the Lord or you wouldn't be here. Ha. Hallelujah. You already love the Lord. Come on. Maybe you're struggling and whether he loves you or not. But I'm telling you right now, you're here. You love the Lord. Just love him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's it all across the building. Let's step into his presence. Hallelujah. I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. Thank you for life and breath. Thank you for your blood that washes me from every sin and from every stain. Lord, your mercies and your compassions, they're brand new this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I praise you this morning, Jesus. Come on, I, I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, being thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endure to all generations. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's like something's wanting to break in here right now. Why don't you take the hand of that person next to you right now? We just need to bind together a little bit right now. Hallelujah. Come on, begin to worship together. Begin to find thanksgiving in your heart together right now. Come on, do it in one mind, in one accord. We're going to do this together. We are the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And he inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, I bless your name. No matter what happened this week, I bless your name. No matter what I feel like this morning, I bless your name. I bless your name, Jesus. You are God and there is none else. There is no other Savior. There is no other King. There is no other provider. Oh, there is no other healer. Hallelujah. Jesus. That's it. Come on. Let it ring from your heart. Let it ring from your spirit. Let it ring from the depths of your soul. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Say it with me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, say it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, say it from your heart. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, let those words out of your mouth right now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Put your hands together and clap unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Let's worship together in song.
back. Amen. Hey! Just this week, just this week, hallelujah, he's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.
you sing that with us this morning? Is he great to you? Just the voices. Amen. How great is our God. Give him your best worship.
He deserves the praise. Hallelujah. He's holy. Hallelujah. He's holy. He's worthy. Our pastor has been speaking on faith. So I've got a faith test for you today. Are you a child of God? If you're a child of God, I want you to lift your hand. If you're a child of God, I want you to lift your hand. The Lord's been putting a scripture on my mind all week long. It simply says, if my people, the child of God, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Is that hand still up there? You're the people he's talking about. You're the people he's asking you right now. Yeah, this is time for our kingdom prayer, okay? But it's deeper than that right now. Where does God want to take you right now in prayer? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. That's your job. Nobody can do it for you right now. You've prayed this prayer a thousand times. We have prayed it for years. You should already know how to do it. Would you let something stir up in your spirit right now? If my people, which are called by my name, we have the name that is above every name, shall humble themselves and pray right now. There's a healing that this land needs. There's a healing that needs to take place in this building today. There's a healing that needs to take place in this world today. There's a healing that needs to take place. Come on. Would you humble yourself right now and say, I'm a child of God. I'm going to pray big prayers. Come on. Would you pray a big prayer right now? Would you allow the spirit of prayer to get on you right now? Would you allow you to humble yourself and pray and seek his face right now?
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Somebody might be waiting for the next thing to happen, then you're not praying. If you're waiting for something else to come up here, then you're not praying. Uh, you should be praying as if this is the end, uh, that Jesus could come in five seconds uh, and your prayer can change the world. Your prayer can change the world. Come on, somebody pray like it's your last prayer. We seek your face, O oh God. Let the spirit of prayer get in us, O oh Lord God, that every moment we can pray big prayers, that every moment we can pray and seek your face, O oh God, to know you, to know you, to seek you, O oh God. Then you will hear from heaven and you will heal our land so desperately needed in this hour, O oh God. We pray for those in authority, God. We pray and plead your blood over them today. We plead your blood over the nation. We plead your blood over Congress. Uh, we plead your blood, Lord, over our president and then vice president. Uh, we plead your blood over our governor. We plead your blood over our assembly, state assembly. We plead your blood over our mayor. We plead the blood of Jesus over the city of Stockton. Uh, we plead the blood over the state of California. We plead the blood of Jesus. Uh, over the United States, North America, every continent on this world, oh God, we plead the blood of Jesus over every continent. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, every lost soul, God, you are not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance, oh Lord. This is your will. We pray your will. We pray your will this morning that all come to repentance. Repentance, oh God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hearing our prayers today. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Hallelujah. If it is appropriate, we want the healing virtue to flow through this building. I know there's people that need a healing. How many know someone that needs prayer right now? You know somebody that needs prayer. Come on, hold that hand up there. You might be the only prayer that's prayed for them today. So we're going to pray together. We're going to pray for every sick body. Come on. Is he a healer? Does his word said, by his stripes we are healed? Is there somebody that still believes that? Come on, there's faith in the building right now. That hand that's lifted for a soul right now, that's lifted for someone that needs a healing. Hallelujah. If you know someone that's next to you and needs prayer, would you pray for them right now? And if you need prayer, why don't you step out in faith and say, will you pray for me? Come on, sometimes you got to press your way through the crowd and get someone to pray for you. That's faith. Hallelujah. Now your hands lifted for someone right now. Lift your voice right now and pray for them right now. Lord, let your healing virtue flow. Come on, pray. Pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord, your healing virtue, let it sweep through this building, oh Lord. Every name that is being mentioned across this building, I know you know every single one of them, Lord. I know you know every situation. I know you know every situation in every family, oh God. Thank you for your healing power. Thank you for your grace and your mercy today. Hallelujah! Jesus, we believe in you. Jesus, we believe in you. Jesus, we believe in you. Hallelujah!
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's do what's appropriate and just give him thanks and praise him for hearing our prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're allowed to come before the throne. Thank you, God, that we can come boldly before the throne. Thank you, Lord, that we're allowed to enter into your presence. Thank you, Lord, that we're allowed to bring our request to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. And you may, may go to your seats here for a moment. We have a couple of announcements we just need to make here this morning. And <coughs> amen. If you are over 65 years of age, I'm not going to make you stand, okay? But we have a special day here today, and most of you know, back behind our uh, platform here in the back room, what's considered probably the choir room, practice room, all of our elders are invited there today. We have a special uh, time for you, and I think most of you have been contacted. We just, if there's a visitor here today, and you are in that category, we would love to visit with you. It's a special time of coffee and fellowship, and I think they have some snacks back there too. So uh, welcome you to please come back, and uh, you're going to meet the pastors and uh, fellowship with all the pastors and even the lay pastors. Uh, we want you to come back there and be with us and spend some time here today. Amen? amen. All of our elders say amen. 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 God bless you. Sister Haney. Ladies of Christian Life Center who are 21 years of age and older, I want you to stand up. See, some of you haven't been honest about your age, and now you're getting called out. <laughs> this Thursday, September 30th, we are going to do something very spiritual. Very spiritual. And I have scripture for you. Proverbs 17, 22 says, laughter and a merry heart works like a medicine. Now, some of you are carrying a lot of burdens. You're heavy laden. You're under a lot of stress. And you need a trip to God's pharmacy. <laughs> no comment from the men. <laughs> So I am inviting you to come out and join us this Thursday from 6 o'clock, there we go, to 8 o'clock. We are going to have a ladies' night out. Woo! We haven't done this in a long time. We need this. We need the fellowship. We need to come together and just connect. So come join us, Stockton Sports Complex. $15 covers your meal and your skate rental. But even if you don't skate, come on out and let's go have fun at the with the fellowship. You can be seated. Thank you. We are also 
about one month away from Ladies Advance 2021. It is going to be a powerful time in the spirit. I have felt this for the last five or six months. You have one week left to register and still get your $50 discount. So next Sunday will be your last Sunday and registration goes up to $70. That's 20 bucks right there. Now we already have a pretty high number of registrants. Uh, people are excited about this because yes, Monterey is a beautiful place to go. And yes, we are staying at a very gorgeous hotel. And yes, we do need a break. Amen, ladies? <laughs> we do need a break. But the main reason, the main priority is that women are feeling a shift that is taking place in the realm of the spirit as God is preparing his people for a new season. Let's be honest. Things just have not been the same since the pandemic hit. Has anybody felt that? Things are just not normal the way that they used to be. But God is going to speak to us as women. He is going to give us some new direction for the new season that we have entered during Ladies Advance this year. Whatever you have to do, I am reaching to you. Bring your daughters bring your mothers, bring your friends, whatever you have to do to get there, make it happen, and it will be worth it. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to take our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Amen. Amen. Say, why do we do it that way? Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Amen? Put a smile on your face then. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your blessings to us. Lord, it's amazing how I've watched even through this pandemic that you've blessed your people with better paying jobs, higher paying jobs, even when it seemed like they were gonna lose their job, they got something better. I've watched you bless your people, Lord. I pray for your people today, Lord, no matter what they do and how they give it, that they, you do love a cheerful giver, but they would give it in faith because you know, God, and we know that you're gonna take care of us. Lord, you said you would rebuke the devourer and open up the windows of heaven for their faithfulness, God. Bless them today. Bless your people and bless this offering here today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you as you give this morning.
Lord. I'm so thankful that you're here and that Jesus is here. That makes a church service. Amen. But today I want to uh, talk from Matthew, uh, and uh, we're going to look at a few verses of Scripture. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 11, and uh, story of uh, John that is in prison. And it starts with verse 1 in Matthew 11, and it came to pass... When Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again these things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And I'd like to read also another verse of scripture in Mark chapter 6, verse 1. It says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which he giveth unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Josie, and of Judah, and of Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And then I'd like to read another passage in John uh, chapter 6. And it says in verse 60 of John 6, It says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, uh, said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Verse 66, And from that time, Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And I want to talk to you today a little bit uh, about the way that Jesus operates uh, and the way that we respond And uh, I believe that it is relevant today in our studies here. And so, the first uh, person that we talked about was the uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a very powerful figure in the Scripture. He's a man that has been mightily used of God. And even in our Lord's own words said, of the dispensation of the law, the dispensation of the Old Testament, there was not a greater prophet that lived than John the Baptist. That would mean in the eyes of Jesus that John the Baptist was greater than Moses and that John the Baptist was greater than Elijah or Elisha. Or that he was greater than King David who was both a king and a prophet. And yet Jesus takes these great men of character 
who had done such great things by faith and wrought such great works of God and had such a commitment to the Lord through their lives. And he says, this man, John the Baptist, is greater than those men. Now that is probably one of the highest compliments and honors that could be given to any of us is that Jesus Christ would call you by name and say of you, of all the people in the church age, that's the greatest man or that's the greatest woman that has ever been. That would be the equivalent of what Jesus said at John the Baptist. He was saying all the people of that dispensation, John is the greatest of them. Now what he meant exactly by the greatest of them um, has been debated, but I think if we just take it at face value, he's putting John the Baptist up here in a place that hardly anyone else would ever attain to. And so John is a great, great man. John the Baptist is also a man that had prophecy that rode upon him. I shared this in our uh, uh, theology class the other day, but in Isaiah 40, the Bible prophesies of a voice that would be heard in the wilderness. And that voice in the wilderness would cry that the way of the Lord, and in that passage of Scripture, the Lord is the tetragrammaton, which means it is not just the Lord as Adonai, but it is the Lord Yahweh. It's the God that created heaven and earth. It's the God of the Old Testament. And here a mortal man was going to be the one that would herald or would make the announcement and prepare the way for God to come in flesh, which we know to be Jesus Christ. What, what, a, what a great man. No other prophet in the Old Testament ever got to live that close and see the Testament maker as John did. All the other prophets were dead when John came on the scene. And John sees the Lamb of God that's going to be used to make the new covenant. And he prepares the way for the Lamb of God. He prepares the way for God to come in flesh. Isaiah got close when he was writing and said, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. But the problem was, he was 700 years too early. And uh, we find some of the minor prophets, as we call them minor, simply by the size of their book, not by the value of the book. Some of the minor prophets in their prophetic visions got very close to Messiah, Jesus Christ also. But none of them had the privilege to actually touch him to speak to him, to know him like John. And yet he was from a different dispensation and would never be able to cross over into the new dispensation. And his job was primarily to preach repentance to a world that was in array. And that was the world of the Jews, but it was so powerful that it extended beyond the household of faith into the non-believer, the Gentile kingdom, that soldiers themselves would come and ask of John, would you baptize me? Would you tell me what I should do? That Pharisees would look at John and would respect him and ask, would you uh, tell me what I should do to make myself a better person. And so he was reaching all levels of society, to the lowest, to the highest, and everything in between. And then shows up Jesus Christ, and he has this great privilege of baptizing him. And when he baptizes Jesus, there is a voice that speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Imagine being the man that's baptizing the Son of God, having your hands on him, standing in the water with him. Uh, I don't know if there, uh, there would be any greater privilege up to that point in time than to be that close and performing that ceremony and doing that service under the Almighty who has just robed himself in flesh so that he could move forward. Now, there is a reason why Jesus was baptized, not because he was a sinner, but he was the lamb that would cut the new covenant. And all the animals in the Old Testament had to be washed before they could be sacrificed. Not only did they have to be washed before they could be sacrificed, but it took a priest that could wash 
those animals. And John's dad was a priest. We find that serving one of the courses of service in the temple when the angel appeared unto him and prophesied that John would come. So that means that John was a priest. He was a priest that was out of the box and he was moved uh, uh, apart from the daily services because he became a fiery evangelist in the wilderness. But Nonetheless, he was born a priest, he was from a priestly lineage, and he had the Lamb of God and he washed him in the water. A type of the Old Testament lambs being washed before they would be sacrificed before atonement. And so there was a typeology that took place there. It wasn't so much that he needed, it wasn't at all rather that he needed the forgiveness of sins, it was that the type was being followed very closely as we get prepared for the last lamb to ever be slain to take away the sins of the world. And John had that privilege and that opportunity. And so John was very powerful. He had audiences where people came to him. He didn't have to go to them, but he just stood on the street corner and the crowds gathered. He went in the wilderness, they followed him to the wilderness. He went to the mountains, they followed him to the mountains. Uh, he was a man that even the kings were a little bit leery of, and he would speak to them. The leaders of society were cautious around him, not just because of his anointing and his power, but the people, they feared and they revered him as a prophet. And if John were to lead a revolution, the people would have risen up and joined him and overthrow through the government. And, and so they were cautious what they did with this man. But finally, the time came where the very words that John himself had prophesied were to take place. He must increase. I must increase decrease. What a prophecy. I'm at the height and the pinnacle of my world, doing what I have been prophesied of the prophets of old to do, fulfilling the will of God, and now it is my turn to prophesy also. I've prophesied the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, and now I'm going to extend another prophecy even beyond that, that this Lamb must increase. He must become greater. He must become well-known. His ministry must uh, go beyond anything I've ever experienced. And not only will He pass me, but I've got to start decreasing. I've got to start losing my crowds. I've got to start losing my disciples. Uh, my life no longer can sustain at this level, but I'm going to be Hold back so he can be in the spotlight. And John makes his prophecy and his proclamation. And he begins to notice that his meetings are a little bit smaller than they used to be. He begins to know that some of his disciples no longer are his disciples, but they've changed and become the disciples of Christ. And he's all right with that. He, he can handle that. He, he, he can believe in that. Because he understands that uh, Messiah is going to set up a kingdom. And in that kingdom, he would gladly be second to the Messiah, the Christ. But then something happens that he did not see in the prophecy. Something happens that he did not see in the Scripture. Something happens that he did not have a word of God in his life for. And he, he doesn't understand why. And that is that he is arrested. And the arrestment has placed him in a prison cell. And in the prison cell, it seems to be the end of his life. And not only seemed to be, but eventually we would know through Scripture, it was the very end. And uh, he is truly decreasing, but not in the way he thought. And so what we have going on here is we have a man that believes in the Bible, but has somehow not fully seen what the Scripture and the prophecies actually meant. It was easy to decrease and let his crowd get smaller in hopes that Jesus would become more powerful than he had ever become. Not only is that so, but he was actually the cousin of Jesus. So he was related to Jesus. And, and it was of his own tribe that was going forward. And, and so that there was something special about that. And he could see this happening in Jesus. And, and it was all right because 
it didn't totally affect him or destroy him. It didn't end his life. It didn't push him aside. It didn't forget him. But now he's in a jail cell. And in this jail cell, hope begins to take wings and fly away. The future begins to lose its allurement and light, and the darkness begins to replace it. The crowds and the visitations are not there anymore. His disciples have become few, and many of them are afraid of government and what might happen, and so the visits are not as often, and he is having downtime and alone time, and his mind begins to do what every human mind does. It begins to think. It begins to have thoughts, and things begin to enter the mind because of his place and his condition, and he begins to contemplate. He begins to think on these things, and he begins to toy with them, and, 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 and he begins to question whether the Word of God and the prophecies of God were accurate and right and whether this man was truly the fulfillment of those things based on his condition. Now, that is so typical of you and I, where when everything is good, <laughs> we see God as something so mighty and powerful and great, perfect in all of his ways, invincible, but when things begin to unravel in our little world, when things begin to go south instead of north, when goodness seems to be absent and evil seems to be present, dreams die, prophecies and scriptures seem to be unapplicable, and it seems like our world begins to be crushed by the world around us and the people around us. And it seems that everything we have hoped for and everything we have believed in begins to be taken and stripped from us. There's a tendency at that point to have a war in our mind. And that war will consist of our belief in what we have believed in being tested as authentic from God. And so John is now not talking as a preacher, not talking as a prophet, not talking as this great man that heralded in the coming of Messiah, but he is talking as just a man that is discouraged and in prison. He's talking as a man who has begun to reason and begin to think and thoughts have got into his mind and strongholds have been built up. Paul will later tell us casting down every evil imagination or every imagination that wars against or speaks out or fights against the Word of God and the thoughts of God. But John didn't have that word then. But that's what was happening. Satan was putting thoughts in his mind. His own flesh had risen up in discouragement and was grasping at things. And John is on a downhill spiral of self-pity. Hopelessness. Darkness. And he gets a couple of his disciples, and he says, I need you to run an errand for me. You remember that man named Jesus that I baptized? My cousin, yeah? The, the one that I said, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The, the one that's healing the sick and, and doing all kinds of miracles. I want you to ask him one question, just one. Because I am so discouraged in this prison. I feel like all my hope is gone. I don't feel I have any future. I feel like everything I did has been wasted. And ending in this 
Surely there's got to be something better for that kind of commitment that I gave to God. That kind of ostracization that took place because I wouldn't walk in the line of the priest like my father, but I chose to follow God and become a preacher and an evangelist and a prophet. I, I proclaim Jesus. I did things others wouldn't do. I stood against the grain. I was criticized by the priesthood. I was looked down on by many. My family tried to pressure me to fill the shoes of my father, but instead I chose to do what God called me to do. And now this is the reward of my obedience to God. Surely there's been some mistake. Uh, maybe not what I did, but who I chose to do it for, or what I chose to do it for. And, and I, I got to know from his own lips, are you really the Christ? This ain't no time to play games with me, Jesus. This ain't no time to put on a facade and pretend to be somebody you're not. I'm in trouble. I'm sitting in prison. My life is pending. My, 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 my ministry is over and, and, and my health is deteriorating and, and the people that used to care for me no longer come around and I'm all alone and I need to know. Just tell me the truth. Are you really the fulfillment of the Bible and the passages and the prophecies. Because right now, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't look like you're one fulfillment at all. It looks like you're an imposter. And I'm very discouraged. Are you him? Or should I be looking for someone else? And they came to Jesus and they spoke to him and said, your cousin, that prophet, the one that baptized you, he asked us to ask you a question. Are you the Messiah? Are you the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah? Are you really... Or should John start trying to find someone else to put his hope in? Should, should John, John wants to know if, there's, if you're an imposter. I, I need to know. And Jesus, I imagine that he was greatly offended or hurt. Not necessarily offended, but he felt that arrow hit him in the heart. There's nothing that hurts worse than when someone that has believed in you forever begins to undermine and question you because of the things that you're doing. And you know that you're doing the right thing, but they can't see the big picture like you can, and so they begin to lose confidence in you. If you live long enough, People that are important to you from time to time will lose confidence in you. If you live long enough, things in the world will go different than what you expected. If you walk in faith long enough, there will be times where it seems like God has forgotten about you. And John was at that point, and he said, I need to know. And, and the Lord responded and said, Go and show John again. Those things which you do hear and see. We often forget one little word in that verse. Again. Show him again. Show him again. Show him again. We're a people that have to see it over and over and over again. We forget what it was like when we were in the world. We forget what it was like when our lives were totally a disaster. You know, there's been a lot of time or a lot of water or a lot of situations that have, have come and gone and, 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 and 
I forgot what it was like when I was in chains of worldly bondage. And I came to that altar and I poured my heart out to God and I saw the supernatural power of God break those chains and I felt the power of God move into my heart and begin to heal me. And and I felt the deliverance and the freedom like I had never felt and I felt the guilt and the shame and the load begin to lift off of me and, and, and I had a testimony to tell everybody for a while. But time... And life has happened. And so now, I know that was real, but it seems almost like a dream or a hazy past because it's been a while. And what I'm in today is so real and engulfing, and it just settled down upon me. I need to hear. I need to see it again. Because I have a tendency to get offended in the way God does business when He doesn't do it according to my plan. I have a tendency to be offended in the way God conducts Himself when I can't pull the strings and I can't control and I can't make it happen. I know some of you sitting there, you you, you got that pious look on your face like you never get there. But the rest of us human beings, we we felt like that a time or two because we're humans. And there's that tendency in us. And, And when I'm left out in the cold and he's turned to someone else and someone else is getting their deliverance and someone else is getting their healing and someone else is getting their prayer answered and I'm sitting in prison, I have a real tendency to struggle with offense at God. As long as he's healing me, as long as smoke's coming out my chimney, as long as it's my family's blessing, as long as it's my friends he's touched, as long as it's the move of God and I get a little splash over, I'm all right. But when I'm picked up and removed and locked up and cut out from the moves of God and I can't join the people and rejoice in the miracles and I can't hear the people praying and see their answers come, something in me starts getting a little bit depressed inside. And I start wondering. And that's where your faith comes in. That's where you have to have an anchor that is sure and a pillar that is deep and piled into the ground and built upon a foundation that life cannot take you away from. And John's in prison and everything he has had has been stripped from him and life seems to be over. And Jesus says, I I want you to tell him again. The blind receive their sight. Now remember, John had seen some of these miracles before he had been arrested. It wasn't that John hadn't seen and heard about the blind having their sight given back to him. He had seen that before He had been arrested. It says that the lame were walking. He knew that people were being healed. And uh, the leper, a disease that was dreaded because there was no cure. And you got put out and you couldn't be around people. And God in flesh through Christ Jesus was beginning to heal these lepers and they were being reunited with their family and they were getting a new lease on life. And, and he knew this. He, he had seen these people. He had heard the stories. Israel's not so big if you've ever been there that you wouldn't cross paths quite often, especially if you're both sharing the same wilderness and the same river, and they both did. And, and they were cousins on top of that. And, and no doubt, even though the Bible doesn't give us much history on John's life after turning toward Christ, he no doubt 
was close to him and had conversation with him and was in some of those crowds when the masses would be there. And, 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 and so he saw the deaf here and he's, he heard, or maybe he was present, I don't know, but at least he heard and believed that the dead had been raised. And he knew that the poor <laughs> had the gospel. And that wasn't just poor in monies and poor of life, but the poor in spirit, the people that uh, were searching for more than tradition, the people that were searching for fulfillment rather than just something that was a, a maze and, 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 and a false front, but something that had reality in it. And, and these people that said, God, we, we're looking for, for more of you. And, and Jesus brought that. And then Jesus says, blessed is he whosoever is not or shall not be offended in me. Telling us that John's not the only one that is struggling with offenses. And if you're not careful, living in life, things are going to come your way that are going to test your trust in Jesus Christ. And that test, if failed, will begin to build an offense in you. So, th so that's one person we've talked about. Let, let's go to another place here and talk about these offenses in the book of John. Actually, let's go to the one we read, the second one in Mark 6. And let me read that to you. Uh, Mark 6. And it says, And he went in from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. So we'll start right there. So we've talked about John, which is his cousin. Now we want to talk about his town, his home uh, place where he grew up at. And when he went there, he went into the synagogue. He had done this many times. The Bible tells us he had done this many times. It says In one place it says as he did a four time, or he had done many other times he went in, he would get, and he would have his turn to read, and that was the way different ones would be chosen to read. He went on the Sabbath day, and he began to teach them. And when he began to teach them, they came to a place where they were offended in him, as the Bible tells us a few verses later. And they begin to reason, and their reasoning was this. We know this person. We know where he's from. We know who his mother is. We knew his father. We know his brothers and his sisters. We saw him raised up. We saw him working in the carpenter. And he's trying to talk to us like a prophet. He's trying to speak to us like some great representation of God. He's trying to give to us words of encouragement. And we know who he is. They really didn't know who he was because they were only looking at Jesus with their natural eyes, not with their spiritual eyes. And the Bible says that they were offended at him. So whatever he did, he, he offended people. And so Jesus makes a little spoken word about that. Now, he, John, he said, tell John they see and they hear and they're healed. Here he says, uh, he makes a little comment, he says, a prophet's not without honor, but in his own country. In other words, a man of God, prophet, is going to have be respected, but when he's at home, people are going to have more trouble respecting him because they know his humanity. They know his frailties. They know his weaknesses, his strengths. that they, they, they can't look past the human and see the anointing and the office that he operates in. All they can see is my clay feet. And that's basically what Jesus is saying there. And so he says that. And then we're going to get to John, and we want to go to chapter 6. And then I want to bring these three together for us today. John chapter 6, and Jesus has been talking to them about being the bread of life and coming down from heaven, and um, he uses the uh, words that I am, and he is in such a way that they understand that he is claiming to be 
the God of Israel, the Old Testament, not just a mortal man. And, and they, were, they, they were already struggling with his claim to be more than just a human that represented God, but that he was the I Am, and that was really struggling with them. But then he begins to talk about uh, the blood that they were to drink and the bread or the body that they were to eat. And uh, they got extremely offended in that doctrine of cannibalism as far as they understood because they didn't see the deeper spiritual teaching that was there. And they thought that he meant that when they would have to eat of his flesh and take that flesh and, and so forth. And, and so they, they, they had trouble with that. And then he went on and he began to teach other things. And we're not given what else he taught about, but it was an expansion, no doubt, on this uh, core message that he was preaching. And it says in verse 60, it says, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Now, many of those disciples that are now having a hard time with him were John's disciples. And then when John lost power, they jumped over to Jesus. And then when Jesus starts talking like he's out of his head, like maybe he's got a fever and he's not thinking straight, like eat my flesh and drink my blood, and to a Jew that was just absolutely unheard of, they thought, you know, he's, he's got a devil in him, he's got possessed. And so instead of being this great healer and this great teacher, now they look at Jesus Christ like he's a demon-possessed man, and what he's doing is by the power of Satan, and the teachings that he's given is by the power of Satan. Of course, not all of them had that mentality. Some of them just thought it was crazy, but many of them thought that a devil had begun to influence him. And uh, they left him, and they said, who can hear it, or who can accept this kind of teaching? And then verse 66 reiterates it with a little more uh, understanding. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back. That's called backsliding, in case you didn't know that. That's why we use a term backsliding, and uh, I don't really know um, what people think in their mind, but when I think of backsliding, one thing I always had as a kid is trying to climb the muddy, muddy banks of the creek and get out, and we'd just keep sliding back down. We'd get almost to the top, and we'd just slide back down and in the water, and, and when you backslide, you're, you're almost there with the Lord, and you just slide back into the world, and you climb back up and you, you slide back into the world. You never really get out of the trough that you're in. You never really get out of the bach that you're in, but you stay down in that old muddy river. And, and, and somewhere you got to get out of there and get on the bank so you're not laying just up there in a slippery position where eventually you're going to slide back down. you got to climb completely out and get your feet on a solid place where you can stand and you don't backslide. Well, these, these disciples, uh, whoever they were, they were backsliding. And they went back. They, they, they came back. Wherever they had started following the Lord, whatever part of life that they said, you know, we're going to follow Jesus, they decided we're going back to that place before we met Jesus, before we made the commitment to follow Him. Uh, much like people today, they get offended in the church. They get offended with the preacher. They get offended with the music. They get offended with the operation. They get offended with God. They get offended with just pretty soon, you can, you, they don't even need a reason to be offended. They just find a way to get a bad attitude about everything. And they just walk away and justify themselves for leaving because they're looking for an excuse. Uh, and, and these disciples said, who can, who can live by those teachings? There, there, there's things that I, I teach in here and, and preach in here that people just say the same thing. Who can live by that? I can't live by what pastor uh, preaches or teaches. I, I can't do those kinds of things. And, uh, and, and it, just, it just is a fact, and there's never been a pastor that could teach or preach anything in the Bible that somebody in life through the last 2,000 years of Christianity, that there wasn't going to be people in every church, in every generation, every time that wasn't going to be offended in when this was taught over the pulpit. And uh, some things, I'll have to tell you, they are hard. They're not easy. Anybody tells you that, you know, there, there's nothing hard, they got it wrong. There's some things, even for me as a pastor, it's tough sometimes to read that and make sense of it and try and live it in obedience. Does that surprise you? It shouldn't. <laughs> That's humanity. 
But Christianity and humanity says, I'm going to do it through the power of God, for I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And by Him living in me, I can live according to those principles that are in that book, even if they're hard for my flesh to do, I can do it. And so you begin a journey, and sometimes you fall down, but you get back up because the power of God is working in you to sustain you, to help you, to be victorious, and to be an overcomer. And so these people, they, they, they got offended in the Lord. And the Lord makes a comment for these people. He says, then said Jesus unto them, will ye also leave me? Will you go also? Think about it. Every time somebody got offended, the Lord spoke to those that were around him and made a comment on it. I wonder what the Lord, you get to thinking about this, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we haven't yet went into eternity, but we're still dealing with time and eternity, that will disappear after the great white throne judgment where only eternity exists and time will be no more. But right now we have time. I wonder what happens when you offend God, what kind of comment he makes to those people saints on the other side. I wonder what he says to the angels about us. It's just the way I think. I don't want him having to make some comment because I did something stupid because I didn't understand or didn't accept his ways. But I want to be one of those that's still standing there that he's making the comment to. (laughs) I want to be one of those that he says, uh, will you leave me also? Absolutely not, Lord. (laughs) I'm in this for the long haul. (laughs) Will you be offended at the way I do my business? Absolutely not. I don't understand what's going on. It doesn't make sense to me. And everything in me wants to just pick up and go home. But uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm I'm here to walk with you. And maybe I'll understand it better by and by. But if I never quite fully understand it by and by, I trust that what you're doing will make sense in eternity someday when you pull back my, the scales on my eyes and you let me see why it happened this way at this time in this life. I'm going to trust God. And trust in God is something that every child of God has to do on their own. You cannot trust God for someone else. You cannot have faith for God, to God, for someone else. Uh, But you have to have your own faith. You have to have your own trust in God. You have to believe in God yourself. In each one of these incidents, the men or the people, the women that were in these groups, they made decisions to let their trust and their faith go in God. And in each one of those groups, there was somebody there that made another decision that was opposite of the decision of the one that was being offended. And that was, I'm going to keep believing in Jesus. And so who will you be in life? Will you be the believer or the offended? Will you be the one that trusts in Him or the one that walks away from Him? Will you be the one that believes in Him or the one that questions everything He does? What will you be in the story of history when the narration is read of this year and this life that we're living and your name comes into the story or the group that you run with comes into the story? What will the narration say about you? They were the offended ones that walked away. They were the offended ones that found fault in the way that I was teaching. They were the offended ones that found fault in my doctrine. They were the offended ones that found fault because I didn't do for them what I did for someone else. And so they found a reason to be offended in me. And and, and there's always going to be somebody because offended people, offenses are easy for the human nature to embrace. It's easy to be offended. I could in just a few minutes here, if I got real ugly, could offend just about everybody in here. (laughs) And if I give each one of you the mic and give you a few minutes and you just wanted to try and offend, we would have the most offended, hurt-feeling service that has ever been recorded in human history. Because we are good at offending each other with our words, and not only are we good with offending people with our words, but we who hear those words are good at getting offended. 
I mean, there's people say things, they don't mean a thing by it, and you get offended. They, they're, not even, they're not even thinking the way you're thinking, and it's just the way it comes out. And you immediately bow up like a toad frog, and you're all been out of shape over something they said, and they can't even figure out why you're been out of shape. And so what happens? You start walking on eggshells around those kind of people. Because you, you know that you, anything, and, and all of a sudden, you just want to get away from them because you're so tied up and tense around them, you don't want to hang out with them anymore. I don't like to be around people like that, that always, I'm always having to look over my shoulder and watch what I say, and I can't just be myself. Why? Because they're going to find something to be offended at what I'm doing. And I imagine Jesus has had to put up with that for 2,000 years. He's had people that always get offended, no matter what he does. As long as he's pulling rabbits out of the hat, and he's causing illusions to take place, and magic to happen, and lights, and he's putting money in their pocket, and giving them good jobs, and everything's going well, and health is in their house, and sickness is in the neighbors instead of theirs, and, and everything's going good, then we're not offended in you. You're the greatest thing in the world. But when the cupboards start getting bare, and the body's not feeling so good. And the world closes in on us. And somebody says something that I don't like and I want to find and take it in and it hurts me. Then immediately God's not as good as God should be. And Jesus has failed me and let me down and, and it, it begins a spiral effect in our mentality in our life. And I'm telling you, it is a dangerous road to be offended in Jesus. How are some of the ways we get offended? Well, one of the ways we get offended is when we pray a prayer, and we're very passionate about it, and we pray, and we pray over something, and we, we feel that we're praying what we should be praying about, it, and it doesn't happen. And all of a sudden... Doubts come to our mind. And we've heard about what God did for someone else. And how God answered this prayer for them and how this miracle transpired. And, and we're trying to believe God for us and it doesn't happen that way. And so... There's a battle that enrages because there's a devil. Many people will never meet Satan head on. You may think you've met the devil. You probably never have really met Satan himself. I think he's too busy for most of us. Maybe he comes against a church if they have a real deep season of prayer and begin to affect the overall. But he doesn't just show up and, and mess with us because we don't really warrant that kind of attention. He's got plenty of fallen angels and demons that work with him that will make you think it's the devil himself. Believe me. And he's got people that will make you think it's the devil in flesh. I mean, he has ways of getting under your skin and coming after you. But you will meet Satan, at least in his system, in your mind. And you'll meet him often there. And in your mind will be thoughts. And in your mind will be words. And in your mind will be feelings. And in your mind will be uh, directions. And it all come together and converge. It all be satanic. It all be of hell. And then with carnal flesh joining the forces of hell, together hell and carnality begin to work out an attack against the spirituality and the Word of God that's in your heart and your mind. Because ultimately, Satan wants people to be offended in God. And these offenses are brutal. Now, have you ever considered that not only has um, humans been offended, people been offended, but also Jesus Christ has struggled with offenses at times. He has uh, had times in his life when he was uh, extremely offended in the way things were happening. The Bible tells us uh, that he got offended when his cousin was killed. 
his cousin was offended in him, and then he was offended when they cut his cousin's head off. The Bible tells us that they came to Jesus, and they told him, they said, Jesus, uh, your cousin just got his head cut off and put on a platter and served to this harlot. And the Bible says when Jesus heard that, when Jesus heard about his cousin and what had happened, the Bible says that Jesus immediately went to the mountains. And the humanity of God, we always we think sometimes that because he was God in flesh that he was invincible to these feelings, but he wasn't invincible. That's what makes him what he is, is that he could struggle and feel what you and I have felt. He could understand what you and I have went through. And as a man, it bothered him what John had happened to him. In fact, when Jesus was arrested, he spoke to everybody except the man that killed his cousin. They poked him, they beat him, they tried to get out, and he would not speak to the king that ordered the head of his cousin. He talked to Pilate. Pilate was a Gentile, a wicked man. He talked to the soldiers. He talked to the Pharisees. He talked to, he talked to a lot of people, even the ones that were wanting his death. He talked to them. But when he stood before the king, Herod, he said, I'm not going to speak to you. And he cut him off. And we learn something there. When you kill the voice of God in your life, it has long-term repercussions. You may not like what God is saying at times, and you may not like the servant of God that delivers what God is saying, but be careful that you don't destroy that voice. Because Jesus showed the king that I will never speak to you again, and that man died, lost, and went to hell. He killed the voice of the man of God in his life. He healed, killed the voice of God's Word in his life. But Jesus, when they told him, he just turned and walked away. It must have been like a kick of a mule in the gut. He, he just felt, I mean, he was just overwhelmed with, uh, with, with a gray sky, a depression. I mean, he just, my cousin's dead. They, they actually did it. Now, he knew it was coming. But there's something about when it actually happens. And he just walked away, and, and, and he went to the mountains. He just had to get away. He needed some time alone. He, it was heavy upon him. But what happened will forever give us a way of escape from discouragement and being offended in the way God operates. And this has been something so wonderfully powerful in my own life. The Bible says, and we don't know the amount of time, but in time, the crowds begin to look for Jesus. And eventually, the crowds found him when he was trying to hide away because of the discouragement and what he was going through by what had been told him of his cousin of the man that had kicked his ministry off, really. The man that was older than him, that the elder, the preacher, the prophet, the one that baptized him, the one that told the world, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world, the one that prophesied and, and was so glad to see him. And, and the man, John, was now dead. And, and Jesus hears it and the Bible says he just turns and he just walks to the mountains. He doesn't say anything to anybody. There's no conversation. There's no comment there much. He just turns and walks away. You see, that's the humanity of God. That's the humanity. And, and a lot of us, we're, we, we, we do that. We, we get hit. We need a little time alone. We've got to get away. We've got to breathe. We've got to think this thing through. We've got to lick our wounds. We've got to have a little healing time. There, there's nothing wrong with that. Jesus tells us that is normal human 
That is normal. Humanity is when all hell breaks loose and bad things happen. Sometimes you need a little space. You can't have people crawling and breathing down your neck all the time. Sometimes you need just to have a little downtime and pray and think it through and just kind of get a, get, a, get a new grip on life. But where we fail sometimes is we stay in that position too long. And when you stay in that position too long, you become vulnerable and it turns into offenses against. And the Bible says when the crowd came, Jesus had to make a decision. Would he go back and look at the needs of the living? Or would he live in the depression of the deceased? And there was a battle. But after that happened, the ministry of Jesus, when you begin to read the miracles that begin to take place, and you begin to read the momentous numbers of people that joined in the crowds that begin to follow him, after that time, the ministry of Jesus became more powerful than it had ever been based on him making the right decision in a very dark place in life. I remember years ago when I first got this uh, teaching, and, and that's what I'm doing today, is just kind of teaching principles, not so much doctrine today, but principles. And I remember I got this, and, and I was reading through this, and then I kept reading, and I looked at, tried to find the sequence of when the death of John happened, and when the ministry of the Lord happened, and, and, and tried to put it in perspective. And John's death came early on in the ministry of Christ, but he had already begun his ministry and was doing great things. But after the death of John, the ministry of Christ takes wings and begins to become incredibly powerful, more so than the, just the beginning. And things begin to be noted in detail. And that's where we get the stories of individual miracles and how they happened and the people that were involved and what they were. And the record of that begins to take place on a more precise uh, a record than prior to the death of John. And, and Jesus is as a human, as God in flesh, as a man. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, it says that Jesus Christ was a man anointed of God who went about doing good, healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. The Bible clearly tells us about his humanity. And we have to keep in mind when we're trying to find the pilot car that is going to lead us through the, the journey of life that we have to follow the man Christ Jesus. We have to see the humanity of Jesus to understand how to maneuver through life's obstacle field that we have before us. The Bible tells us that he made that decision, that the ministry, that the call, that the prophecies, that the will of God was more important than the sucking of his own thumb. And he turned and he said, yes, I heard that my cousin has been killed. I am depressed and I feel that I, it is wrong what happened and, I, and I'm, I'm upset about it and I just would like to run. Because God didn't say anything about cutting his head off. He just said he wouldn't have as powerful of his ministry as me. This is the man, Christ Jesus. God didn't say anything about this kind of a death. There's nowhere in Scripture says, and John will have his head chopped off. Or the man that opens the gates for Jesus Christ to come in the flesh, uh, there will be God that the world can see, would, would, would die a, a death like that in a place forgotten by the public almost. And yet God reserved the right to close the ministry of John the way he wanted to. And Jesus, as a man, had to submit to that. Jesus had several times to submit to the will of God that was not his own desire. I think the greatest knowledge of that is when we see him in the garden and there's a cross that's just a few hours away. And there's a disciple that he's had in his bosom that's like a serpent that's going to betray him. And there's a priesthood. And he 
It had been offered early on in his ministry, the kingdoms of this world, and he could have bypassed the cross and never went to Calvary. But if he had done that, he would have been like any other man, and that kingdom would have passed away with time. But the way he acquired the kingdoms of God is that they will be his for eternity. And he laid on that rock in that garden and he cried out to God. He said, not my will. What was he saying? As a man, I don't want the cross. As a human being, I don't want to go through this. As a man, I don't want to face That kind of agony and pain and rejection. I've been at the top of the pinnacle with crowds of thousands. I've seen miracles that no other prophet's ever seen and multiple miracles that no other prophet's ever had. And I could resurrect this Jewish remnant and we could storm this gate and we could establish this kingdom and take down Rome with this kind of power. And everything within me wants to do it this way. You see, I want to bypass the cross. I want to bypass this immediate. And I want to get to the coronation. (laughs) I want to get to the crown that sits on my head. I want to get to the regal throne where I rule the world. I don't want to die. Ain't much of us, any of us in here much unless we're really depressed that want to die. Most of us have something that no matter how bad life gets... We want to live, and we have a little hope that it'll get better, and when we're living, that's why we want to live, is because we think possibly it could get a little better in the future, even though it may not. And I'm talking to some people today that have been living in depression, and whether you know it or not, you have got bitter at God, and you have been offended in the way God has done His business. I'm talking to hearts today. And you are blinded and cannot see that you've got offended at God and you're upset with God. And it has affected your spiritual life because of your feelings that you have allowed. And it's not just people that are in this building, but people that are listening in these cameras and in their homes and and in, in, in the casting of this service. And some of you can't even come back to church You can't even pray anymore because you don't know how to pray. There's something in you that you can't even ask God because you're so offended in the way God's been operating, in the way you think it should go. And your faith has come down and you've pulled away from God and you're going through the motions and you look good and you act good and you pretend and you do it, but inside there's a hollow sound when they hit the drum. There's a way to overcome this. You've got to lay it on the altar. You've got to understand that there is a battle of wheels and that this is not the end, but this is a journey and God has to have His way for you eventually to be restored to the things that you're reaching for. And so you've got to say, Father, not my will, but Thy will be done. I submit to you. I I refuse to allow these emotions and these setbacks and these things that have not went so good life to overcome and become a monster that controls me and chains that bind me and a prison that holds me. But I refuse to allow that in my life. And so Jesus turns around and he says, there's one way to beat this. (laughs) If I can't see the power of God deliver John, I'll see the power of God deliver these that have come. And he begins to lay hands on the sick. He begins to raise the dead. He begins to heal the blinded eyes. He begins to open the deaf ears. And he begins to preach the gospel. And as he preaches the gospel, the good news, there comes hope and faith. And a man that was in prison that lost his hope, now a multitude has got hope. And he realizes that the forces of hell are being driven back by one decision that I'm not going to succumb to my feelings but I'm going to succumb to the prophecy and the word of God and do what God called me to do and by doing what God has called me to do I will come and do more than Satan was ever able to do against my cousin John 
and he raises up and he walks into the multitude and he begins to teach the word of God. He begins to teach the parables of the kingdom. He begins to teach the message of God's kingdom. Come into mankind. And as he begins to teach, the power of God begins to loose and the ministry of God in Christ begins to manifest in this world. Are you him or should we look for another? If John had been able to live a little bit longer, he would have seen an escalation of the power of God manifest. But you see, John wasn't the only one that struggled with this. After Jesus was crucified, we find the disciples and some of the women locked in a home, not just in a home, but locked in a home with fear. What are you afraid of? Our champion's gone. The, the man we put all of our faith in is gone. He died. I, I, I'm, I'm in shock. I, I, I just thought somehow he would come off the cross. I just thought somehow he'd speak and, and they'd all fall down and die. And, and, and I, I just believed in, in his body's in the tomb. And a couple of them got so depressed when they finally got the nerve to go outside the house. They said, you know what, let's just let's go back to our old lives and start fishing and try and make a little money and just lose ourselves in life. Get busy. So we don't, and let's just kind of try and forget about it and, and, and escape from what really happened and, and not talk about it anymore. This is, this is life preaching, teaching today. And Jesus lets them feel like that for a while. He gives them a little time. But then he shows up. So why don't you put the net on the other side of the boat? I think I heard something like that. You see, and it doesn't matter what generation you're from. And it doesn't matter what group of disciples you're in. There's going to be times where you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. Is this the end or is this the beginning? Is this over or is this an open door to another room that's greater than anything I've ever seen in the past? I may have to leave some things behind some hurts, some people. I may have lost some things that were precious to me, but life has taken them from me. And, 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 but I'm, I'm going to walk through this door anyway without them. I'm going to leave the past behind, even though it hurts, and even though I love, and even though I care. I can't carry that with me and do this. So I'm going to bury this, and, and I'm going to pay my respects, but I'm getting up and I'm walking through the open door. I'm walking into the place of ministry. I'm walking into the place of the anointing. I'm walking into the place of prayer. I'm going to get back into intercessory prayer. I'm going to get back into the things of God. I'm going to get back to where God is moving and God is doing. I'm going to get back to claiming and calling on the name of God to do great mighty things that we believed He was going to do before, but even greater here in the future. I'm coming back, Lord. Don't count me out. Yes, there was a little offense and there was a discouragement and it was a, but am I back on track today? I recently had a conversation with a person that was right where this is message is at today. And in their heart and mind, God had failed them. Now, they, they didn't say it quite like that, but that's what they meant. I was compassionate because I have felt that in 40 years of having a relationship with God, 45 years. I, I felt that a few times myself, but I've never had the nerve to speak it <laughs> or to say it. <laughs> It's just some things I don't want the devil to hear me thinking out loud. <laughs> 
I'll just pray it through and, 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 and get my spirit and get my faith up and then that goes away and the healing bomb of the Lord comes in and makes all that right and, and I don't have to carry that around. But you, you live long. But boy, they, they was having a tough time. And I, 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 I ask him a question. Here's a real simple question. Who's the God in this situation? And who's the mortal? Whose plan or whose will are we living? And why do you do it? And I think when you're honest and you answer those questions, it puts it all back in perspective. God's not a puppet. I'm not the puppeteer. I didn't write the story or the narration. I've just been asked to be a character in it. And the reason that I do this is because of such a reward that no other story has at the end. I shall see Him. I shall be like Him. I shall live eternally with Him. Church, Offenses have come. Offenses will continue to come. And I don't know what tomorrow holds. Now, some of you, 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 you've had the last few minutes. This is all about the elections with Governor Newsom. I haven't thought of that a minute. I'm thinking about life itself, not governmental ups and downs. And if you don't get that out of your mind... Because if that offends you, something that small, there probably isn't any hope for you. Because of his government, there shall be no end. That's all you got to rest in. That's all you got to rest in. But we're not talking about California elections right now and being offended because you prayed and God didn't knock Newsom out and all that stuff. Or keep him in. Some of you got your prayer answered maybe. I don't know. But we're talking about life itself that's in your home. Life itself that's in your body. Life itself that's in your marriage. Life itself that's in your emotions. Life itself that's in your own personal prayers and your own personal time. The desires that you have and the hope that you have and what you want. That's what I'm talking about today. And church, if we are going to make it, and we're going to be the victorious people that God has designed us to be, then we are going to have to get ourselves busy. I have spent a year and nine months, ten months, Seems like that long. Maybe there's a few months we could distract from, uh, take away from that. Preaching faith, hope to this church. If you ain't got it now, you probably, it's like a doctor once told a friend of mine, he said, I can't help you anymore. You need to get a new doctor. This preacher can't help you anymore. This church can't help you anymore. And there ain't another church, but you need to go see if you can find one because maybe you'll find someone to help you. You've had the Word, you've had the anointing, you've had singing. Not, not every service has been the greatest service in the world, but every service has had worship, Jesus, and the Word, and you ought to have been able to take something or at least sustain what you got from the service before. Some of you are on empty by Tuesday, and you've had enough Scripture where you should be fooled till next year this time. I mean, there's countries in the world. I told Brother Meeks this earlier today. We were talking. I told him, I said, Brother Meeks, I said, there are countries that get less than what we get in one service, and they manage an entire year in countries where they can't have any services or worship or word like we have. They have to do it on their own. And we can't make it to Wednesday or 
Sunday. I'm not saying all of us, that's not, but as a, as a general rule, the American people are so frail and weak. And yet we have so much inside our cabinets. Our pantry is full of the food of God. Our jugs are full of the liquid of the Spirit. And if we are going to face what is at our doorstep, and we are going to be what we can see in this book, we are going to have to take our thumbs out of our mouth, put our feelings deep, deep inside that cannot be offended, and get the skin of a rhinoceros, and we are going to have to get back into what this thing is all about. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is a mandate of the Almighty Christ that has given us a call to stay focused in what God has called us to do. Now, the world for some of us is not going to another continent. It's right here in Stockton. World represents your surroundings. You don't wait for some door to open, but somewhere we got to start walking in places and ministering to people. And as we begin to do that, something flows through us. And when it flows through us, it begins to touch those around us. And what's touching them, you can feel it as it flows through you. You ever minister to someone, really minister to someone, you walk away, you feel like you're on cloud nine if you help someone and the Spirit's flowing through you. The problem is some of us haven't ministered to anybody for a while. We've just been ministered to me, ministered to me, ministered to me, ministered to me. Some of you need to start ministering to someone else, helping someone else, praying with someone else, giving word to someone else, giving ministry to someone else. God didn't call you to just be a receiver, but He called you to be a giver. He called you to pour it out and to give it to other people. Church, we've got to get up and we have got to move forward and we have got to start ministering the works of Christ, the Word of Christ, the person of Christ to a lost in a dying world. That is the hope for depression and that is the hope for defense offenses. That is the hope is to give out of ourselves. Amen. So this week we have a homework assignment. I want you to find somebody this week and talk to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you several things here. Now, they, I'm not talking about inviting them to church. I'm talking about actually you doing the one talking to them about what you want them to hear when they get to church. So, so we need to do that this week. Now, some of you are going to come back like the, hundred, or the, the 70 rejoice and say, even the devils are subject to us. <laughs> You'll be so excited the results that are going to happen. And it's going to lift your chin off of the gutter and uh, get, get put some sparkle back in your eye and a little bounce in your foot because God's going to use you this week. And you're going to be excited. I want you to find five people this week outside of your immediate. And when I mean your immediate, you know, your, your, your husband or your wife or your children or, or a close friend, you, you pray for them too. They need it and you need it. But outside of that, I want you to find five people outside of yours and I want you to try and pray for them. That would be one a day minus two days for a seven-day week. And so every day you get 24 hours to try and find someone and say, could I pray with you? Now, you don't have to pray that God will heal them from cancer or God would heal them from diabetes or God would heal them from or, or make their legs. It doesn't have to be physical miracles. It can be miracles of the heart. It can be miracles of relationship. Listen to what people are telling you. Sometimes people are telling you things. I'm really going through this. Somebody at work shows up and they start telling you about how tough life is. That is really giving you an open door. Why don't you stop right there and say, hey, would you let me pray with you about that situation? 
You don't even have to open the door. This week, you're going to run into people that are going to tell you how life's really messed up for them. It happens almost every week to me, and I'm not in the public like some of you. People are going to tell you things, and they're not going to, be, they're not going to realize that what they're doing is they're, they're opening the door for you. God's really opening the door for you, and we haven't been taking advantage of that. I want you, when you hear someone start to tell you, and God's going to bring people to you this week, I'm telling you, to, that need prayer, and they're not always going to come. Would you pray for me? I know you go to church. I know you believe in Jesus. I know you're a great person of prayer. Some of you may get that luxury, but most of us will not. But listen for the creaking of the hinges, the twisting of the knob, the opening of the door. And when someone says there's something they're going through or this problem or that problem, stop right there and see if the door is open enough to walk through. And then I want you to journal what happened after you prayed for them. So that's the second thing I want you to do. I want you to pray for five people. The third thing I want you to do is I want some of you to pray every day. I don't care if you don't feel like praying, if it's just hallelujah, God. You write down prayers and read it to God even if your heart's not in it. Now, I want a commitment on this one. How many would commit, even though you may not feel like, you will go home today and you'll write down some things that need to be prayed. Maybe you start with verse or, 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 a number one and say, I love you, Jesus. Two, I worship you, Jesus. Three, I still believe in you, Jesus. Four, I need you to give me a revival in my heart and revive me. Five, and just start with some simple things. And then, I need you to let your kingdom come in our life and set your throne up in our heart and rule our lives, my life, my wife's life, my children's life, my parents' life, whatever the demographics are. And just simple things. If you'll make that kind of effort, God will build the bridge and do what you can't do. But if you won't even start, it's pretty hard God gets you moving. And so I want people this week that will say, Pastor, I will pray every day. I will write a prayer down so I'm not just going around, hallelujah, hallelujah, touch them, bless them, hallelujah. It's not a prayer that you actually are focused, even if it's simplicity. How many would agree to write a prayer this week, and hopefully it'll expand throughout the week, but you'll write a prayer where it's a few minutes at least now, some of you are praying hours every day. I appreciate that. But I'm reaching for everybody to say a prayer this week that is in the building and that is on the uh, uh, broadcast listening. Every one of you. I don't know how many that is, but there's a lot of us. If every one of us to pray every day, imagine what that would look like in the spirit realm and imagine what God would give back to us and how the revitalization of Christians everywhere would begin to take place. If you're at home and you're watching this, I want you to lift your hand and say, I will commit to pray every day this week and write a prayer down this afternoon. Good. I see you. Not really, but God does. So don't lie to God. Now, if you didn't lift your hand the first time, lift it again. And say, not, not you in here, them on there. And if they're look at you, you're on the road, just kind of wave at them, but really you're telling the Lord, yes, Lord. I want you to make that promise. Do you understand? It's important. Now, let's do that in here. How many will write a prayer this afternoon? Now, some of you don't need a prayer, but if you don't need a prayer and you will pray every day, do it. But if you need to write something down because you're just hitting a wall in your prayer, I want you to write a prayer. Let's lift our hands and say, Pastor, this week, this week, you know, that's not 100%, but that's a good percentage of people that are going to pray. That's a good percentage of people. Come on, lift it up if you will. Now, someone else, uh, that, why wouldn't you want to pray every day this week? Even if it's a short prayer, why wouldn't you want to pray? Thank you. You can put your hands down. This is going to look wonderful. We are redrawing a face we're redrawing a plan. We're redrawing a map that needs a little attention. And we're coming back. We're making a decision today 
to do something that's productive. There's one more thing I want to do, and then we'll close. It's 11.44 on the clock up here, and I think that's about right. So one more thing I want to do. How many will make a confession? I refuse to be offended in the way he conducts his business, and I accept the will of God. How many will make that? Would you lift your hand? I refuse. Now, it can be variant of what I'm saying, but it's the point that you're saying, I'm not going to be offended in God, and I'm going to let God's will unfold my life, and I'm going to worship Him for it. I'm going to love Him for it. I'm going to accept it and say, God, I belong to You. You're in charge of my life. I'm rather excited this week. I'm rather excited to get up tomorrow morning. Because tomorrow morning, something's going to happen in the spirit realm. Something's going to happen in the body of Christ. Something good is about to take place because we are taking steps of initiative to do what God has wanted us to do instead of letting depression and sorrow rule our lives as believers. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Let's stand if we would this morning. Praise God. I want to tell the church, I appreciate you so much, all you do, your faithfulness. Uh, God's people is a wonderful, wonderful institution and body, family. And the devil so badly wants to cripple us and destroy us. But we ought to pray for one another should be part of our prayers. I've been praying for some of you. I know you have been going through it. I've been lifting you up to God, and I promise you, you're going to make it. You'll do the simple little things we're talking about and make a conscious decision. You know, discouragement is a decision too. The older I get, the more I realize that more things are not emotions. They're the byproduct of decisions. Love's not an emotion, it's a decision. And emotions becomes a byproduct of a decision to love. And discouragement is a decision that you embrace and say, I'm going to be discouraged. You're going to allow that. It's not that it won't hit you, but when it sets resident up, it's because you embraced it. You made a decision to allow it to have residence. Some of you are going to have to fight this every day because when you throw it out of your house, this mind, it's going to come back knocking, not just the next day, but about 10 minutes later. And you just said, I'm sorry, the motel's full. There's no room for you in here. I got a word of God here. I read a new scripture I put here. I'm thinking some good thoughts. I listened to a good music. I, I talked to a friend, and we had a good laugh. And I'm filling the house up with something that's beneficial. I'm not going to allow that. <laughs> And it'll knock again. You just say no. And then someone will come and offer you something to really give you an emotion with it, to twist it and get it in. You just say no. The mind's not a garbage can, so it doesn't have room for those kinds of things. It's a delicate, beautiful creation of God. Amen. And we are going to have victory in the Lord today. Amen. Would you lift your hands and love God for a moment? Would you lift your hands and just worship the Lord today? Hallelujah, Jesus, we worship you. And we thank you, God, because your word is so wonderful. And there is so much health and vitality in your spirit through your word. And we find hope where there is no hope except in the Word of God. And we appreciate, God, that You have spoken to us today. And we appreciate, God, that we have a future in the name of Jesus. We love You, Lord, today. And we confess Your words. We breathe Your words. We speak Your words. We meditate on Your words. We think about Your words. And we're so grateful that we have the Word of the Lord to sustain us and to build our houses upon and to build our lives upon today. We bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We love you, God. Thank the Lord for using you this week. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, for using Christian Life Center, using us in prayer, using us to witness to people, using us to do the will of God in this generation that we live.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'd like somebody to pray in the Holy Ghost for a few moments. We're in closing, but let's pray in the Spirit today. Jesus today, touch us and anoint us and empower us as a church today. God, lift us up. Lift us up and use us, God, in a mighty way. Put a Put a hedge of protection around us. Uh, loose the bands of wickedness. Undo the heavy burdens. Cause the light of God to shine. In the face of God to smile upon us at Christian Life Center today. Uh, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed today. I want you to have a great afternoon and rest in the Lord for a great week this day that we're living in. Amen. God bless you.